Hey everyone, it's Seth, and uh, today we're going to do a follow-up with John Durant, who is one of our seed speakers at the 2014 Festival in Austin. John's an author, health entrepreneur, and speaker. His 2014 book, The Paleo Manifesto, explores the evolutionary reality of the human species as it relates to modern life. And if you caught his seed talk from last year, you learned a bit about the importance of habitat for optimizing human health. I'm looking forward to diving a little bit deeper into this idea as it relates not just to personal flourishing, but also on a broader level from community to world. So welcome, John. Hey, how's it going, man? Great. Good to see you again, or at least see you on the internet. <laughs> uh, I don't know how, how paleo Skype is. I guess. Uh, you know, it, it, it makes the world you know into a village, so I guess it's pretty paleo. <laughs> I like it. Cool, man. So to jump in, uh, your seed talk, you know, you focus on habitat. We talk about habitat and how it relates to optimal health. And um, I think many people think about health or have come to think about health as like this genetic kind of deterministic mindset of like, oh, if you have that gene, you're going to get cancer. Or um, So how exactly, you know, do you, do you paint that picture of how environment, the things that are outside of our body, affect our health and quality of life? Uh, I mean, I was just reading an article on addiction that was pretty fascinating, and, and it talked about a, uh, a, a famous animal study, well, famous for, as the study goes, uh, called Rat Park. And a lot of the studies um, that form the basis of what we know about addiction in animal models um, were basically done on mice and rats in cages. And what, what they eventually discovered, you know, and, and if you give morphine, cocaine, type stuff like that to the rats in these cages, you know, they get addicted really easily. That's all they do all day. Um, and, you know, and they get more interested in that than sort of food or moving or sex or whatever. Um, what they eventually found was that if you actually put rats or mice in, a, a habitat where they had stuff to do, where they had, where they could socialize, where there were um, toys to play with, where they had more space and whatever. They actually didn't get addicted to the drugs. Like they would take them um, maybe initially, but they wouldn't become addicted to them. And it's and it's a really interesting uh, example of how a lot of what we think is sort of true about a substance, very deterministic. You will get addicted to these cigarettes. You will get addicted to sugar. You will get addicted to heroin, whatever. Um, some of that is actually determined by our habitat, our life, our relationships. And, you know, there, there are a lot of people in hospitals, the, the piece points out, who are on morphine or other opiates as painkillers. And once they leave the hospital and that habitat, they go back to their home, to their life, to their family connections, to their identity, and they don't get addicted to, you know, to these hardcore opiates that that they were taking in the hospital. That's interesting. So it, it, it yeah, it really challenge like it. This notion of habitat, uh, it, it it really uh, challenges. Um, what uh, a lot of what people think is the conventional wisdom of getting healthy, which is either fatalistic, sort of it's in your genes, or um, it, it, it's fatalistic in sort of a sense of, of will and determination that if you don't have Herculean discipline and willpower, you're not going to be able to become healthy. Mm. And so what, what would be some examples of, of um, I guess, uh, environmental factors and how they how would you describe the like biophysiological process that happens when you're in a certain habitat versus another, you know, pairing with your genetics in particular? What, what would be like some examples of, of that process? Well, I mean, you can have extreme forms of developmental issues if you don't have the right stimulus. So if, if uh, an animal or a person is raised without light, then their eyes never develop the ability, you know, to, to, to function properly. Um, you can have stunted growth, um, you know, foot binding in China. If you, if you don't get the right feedback from your environment during a developmental process, the growth won't happen correctly. So it, you know, the, it, it, the appropriate epigenetics requires some sort of 
interaction between the organism and its habitat. But but then you know take okay so um, it, take the example of light. Well, you if if we have ambient light in our bedroom from electronic devices and phones and screens and computers and iPads and whatnot, um, we can't overcome the effect of that light on our body using discipline or willpower or genes. I mean, I mean the, the, the light, the right type of light, if it hits you, it, you know, it, it will keep you up later. It will shift your circadian rhythm. Um, it, it will decrease your melatonin production. Um, and you will sleep poorly as a result. Um, and, and then all, all sorts of other things go to hell. So, um, it, you know, the issue of light in your bedroom or in your life is a profoundly important one and it has nothing to do with discipline it is all to do with how you set up your physical spaces yeah and this you know what comes to mind is is as you bring up you know old studies and whatnot is that we tend to look at at at, at scientific research we take these units of human beings we say we studied these 70 human beings and they're all the same human being and look at what the effect of this one thing that we changed you know, what it did for their health. But, but what you're pointing out is how diverse, you don't really have a, a perfect control single human. I mean, not just to mention the genetic variation, but the, as you mentioned, the epigenetic variation, when they go home, what type of light do they have when they sleep? You know, what, what, what sort of uh, air quality are they breathing in and how can that affect the outcome of that research? So how do you, what's your perception on how that realization plays into the, the way that we, you know, study everything and come to realizations about everything. Well, you know, doing properly controlled studies in human health and nutrition is difficult, you know, difficult to impossible. And uh, there are just so many different factors. People are different. Um, you know, when it's a pill and, and you can have, you know, one pill that has the active agent in it and another that's a sugar pill, it's easier to control. But when you're talking about lifestyle factors or food, you know, people can tell the difference um, in whether they're eating a low carb or a high carb diet. You know, you, you, can't, you can't have a bl completely blind study in that regard. Um, and, and the other thing is that, you know, the... the when, you, when, when you're dealing with complex systems like the human body or like an economy or like the climate, um, these, these, are, these are very difficult systems to understand. And sometimes two, three, four changes add up to something that's much more than those individual changes on their own. Um, so, you, you know, sometimes, you know, we tinker with one aspect of our diet or one aspect of our health, but if you're actually able to change five things at once, you might be able to get sort of a step change in difference and an outcome, um, than sort of tinkering with any one of them on, on its own. Interesting. And so does that go the other way too? If you tinkered with, you know, your personal habitat in a few simple ways, could it have you know, a compounding sort of effect with, with how, how that affects your health. Oh, I, I mean, absolutely. And, and in either direction. I mean, I, I moved apartments recently within New York and I love the people I was living with before. I, I like the fellow who I'm living with now, like every, everybody's great. The, um, you know, but previously I wasn't surrounded by people who were into health and fitness. And so I wasn't as into health and fitness as I often want to be. Um, or, you know, a lot of people find that it's easier to quit smoking when they move or when they change jobs mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe they go through a divorce or they get married or something where there's some shift, major shift in their life where not only do they change spaces, but they get to sort of be a new person and restart. And, and that's real. I mean, that, 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 those, those are real effects where when you can make a few changes at once, you actually get much better outcomes, you know, an order of magnitude difference than, than if you just try to quit smoking or eat healthier on January 1st or 2nd. Yeah. So that, that's interesting. You can have these compounding effects between different things. So, so we want to talk about, you know, how, 
uh, a species does well when it's mimicking its natural habitat. So first, what would you say our natural habitat is as a species? And then how can we sort of, you know, I mean, you live in New York City, right? I assume you're several stories up. So, so how can we, how can we, I guess first let's go with what is our natural habitat? Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go even, I'm going to go one step back further just mm. to, to clarify one thing, which is there actually are many from a, there are many species that thrive um, outside of their natural habitat. If you think of different invasive species, Asian carp in the Mississippi or um, uh, uh, kuru or um, uh, or what's the vine in the south that covers everything, whatever that vine is, uh, uh, kudzu, kudzu, and, um, uh, you know, zebra, zebra mussels and things like that. Um, so from a Darwinian perspective, you do get different organisms, species that may move into a novel habitat and be extremely successful. Mm -hmm. When we're talking, what I'm talking about in terms of thriving or being successful is the individual sort of health and well-being of an organism. Um, and and in, in those cases, being in a habitat that, that that organism, that species is pretty well adapted to is usually the right place to start. Um, so, so then thinking about... Um, Okay, so what was the next piece? So, so wanted to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of what it is that our natural. I mean, we're so yeah. you know far from. I mean, the, the diversity of our habitats are different from New York to Austin right. to Chicago right. to Africa. So, what what is um, a way of kind of framing natural habitat? Yeah, natural is always sort of a tricky word. Um, you know, humans humans uh, evolved. Uh, on the African savanna over the last few million years. Um, during that time, we lived in some different, you know, habitats. Uh, there, there were different phases of that. So, you know, in a, um, in, in one sense, there is no one single habitat that we are well adapted to. At the same time, it, it, from sort of a statistical perspective, there is this concept of the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, or EEA, which, which is a statistical concept that, that says, okay, um, over the course of the past however many generations, there is a certain level of adaptation of different traits to these, you know, types of things. Um, so, so what did that lifestyle look like? Um, and, and none of that is to say that evolution has stopped. I have to give all these caveats mm -hmm. in case, like, a proper evolutionary biologist is listening. Um, and... Uh, Okay, so obviously we weren't sedentary all day. Um, we weren't indoors all day. We weren't eating Twinkies and you know drinking Coca Cola all day. So so you know people are pretty much in agreement that this industrial sort of industrial or information age lifestyle that we're living right now we're not very well adapted to, um, or at least in terms of you know raw physical health. Um, in in um, you know, so we were hunter gatherers, we were living in the wild, um, in small social bands that were migratory. We were on our feet a lot. We walked many miles a day. Um, we had a variety of different types of movement to survive in the wild. We'd lift things and carry and throw, um, and run and have sex and fight and all these sorts of things. Um, in terms of circadian rhythm, you know, spent a lot of time, um, in our evolutionary history around the equator um, and being exposed to both, you know, light and darkness over fairly regular intervals uh, o over our evolutionary history, though certainly people who have left the equator um, have some circadian adaptations to um, other, other um, latitudes. Um, and, and all, I mean, just all sorts of different things the the types of foods uh, that we ate were hunted and gathered in the wild. And, um, you know, then once we started cooking, it incorporated more types of food. So, um, it, it, it was a very, very different lifestyle, even though there was some variation within it, it was a very, very different lifestyle to what we're, we're living today. And the mismatch between the two, um, is the source of, of a lot of these chronic health conditions. Yeah, and so with that in mind, you know, how do you think, um, you know, because some people could say, all right, let's look at how we evolved and try to adapt to that natural habitat. Or as you mentioned, adaptation to 
a, a novel, a new habitat. Um, how do you see the kind of optimal approach to taking in the reality of, of our biology as a species from an evolutionary perspective and pairing it with a, you know, that adaptiveness of how do we figure out how to hack our current state um, to, to work our way into it, you know, rather than right. just trying to change everything to be back like the natural state? Right. I, I mean, you know, first of all, uh, biological evolution um, takes some time. Um, you know, it can vary how long, but it's generations. And, and so, you know, in my lifetime or your lifetime, which is what I care about and you care about, um, we are not sort of genetically adapting to the lives around us. We may adapt sort of mentally, psychologically, um, but but we're not adapting in, in the, the sense that most biologists typically refer to the term um, or use the term. Um, so, but it, it's it's a balance and people have to experiment. And, and what, what a lot of people find is that, um, you know, if you, um, that there's, you know, key areas where it's hard to compromise on our, our, you know, diet, movement, sunlight, um, human, you know, social contact, things like that, where we've really got to figure out a way to, um, eat in a way that, that, that our species has been doing in a while, uh, has been doing for a while. And, but then, you know, there, there are other, the other ways to to flex and adapt to modern living. I'm living in the middle of New York. I'm not actually eating wild game, but guess what? You know, I'm eating some animals, you know, grass-fed animals or things like that. And and so, okay, it's a domesticated animal, but, you know, based on my own personal experimentation, I'm not seeing some sort of, like, dramatic difference between wild game specifically and an animal, you know, a domesticated animal that's been eating its natural diet. Um you know, uh, my body can't tell the difference really between our, or it can't between artificial UV and real UV as long as it's at, you know, a certain wavelength or intensity. So, that, you know, there are ways to use technology to mimic that. Um, but, you know, we don't know. I don't know what the balance is. And people are going to have to strike a different balance and just experiment and say, you know, do I feel healthy? Am I performing well? You know, does my partner think I'm sexy? Uh, um, and and use those as measures of saying, like, am I satisfied with the life I'm leading? And if I'm not, if I'm having, you know, these different health problems, then, then maybe going back to, you know, our look at our evolutionary history can be a, a useful way to address it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I wanted to ask you, you know, some of the simple hacks that we can do to adapt more to this modern environment. Um, but it seems like what might be a more appropriate question is actually what are some of the experiments that you can do in order to find out what you could do to hack your habitat? Because everybody's, you know, everybody's different, like you said. And um, the question comes down to, boils down to, um, not necessarily what the scientific research paper says, but does it make you feel better? Are you performing yeah. better? All that. So, so what would be some practical things that people could look at in their personal habitat that they could test or experiment with to, to move towards an, a more optimal habitat? Well, um, you know, last year I, I interviewed the, the late Seth Roberts, and he was the master of personal experimentation. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't get too fancy about it. He, he would just say, okay, uh, I'm not sleeping well. So I am going to take a piece of paper and a pencil, and when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to rate how refreshed I feel on a scale of one to five. And he would just do that every morning on an ongoing basis and would also sort of keep track of ways that he may have changed his life. So, um, you know, so, something that someone can easily do, get your pad of paper, get your little scale of how refreshed you feel in the morning and, you know, do a before and after of sort of uh, old light, you know, electronic ambient light in your room, you know, as you've been doing it for weeks or years or whatever. And then, you know, take, get some electrical tape, cover up the lights, unplug some electronics, keep your phone in a different room, keep your computer in a different room, do that for two weeks and rate how you feel. 
and and you know and and that's all that's all you have to do. People experiment with diet stuff all the time. One of the experiments I'm doing, one of the things I've now integrated into my life, which is pretty fun, is uh, this is from a company called AO Biome, and I'm I'm helping them out as an advisor. Disclosure, mm-hmm. um, but they have uh, a particular type of good bacteria for your skin um, that you can you can spray on. Now this particular bacteria. It's called ammonia oxidizing bacteria. It metabolizes ammonia. Ammonia is in your sweat. It's in your feces. It's also an irritant on the skin. And this bacteria is very sensitive to uh, ingredients in most soaps and skincare products and things like that. So, um, y- you know, if, if somebody has a skin issue, if they have acne or eczema or, or you know, smelly feet or jock itch or something like that, and, and, and it's been persistent, you know, they can run an experiment and say, okay, uh, I'm going, you know, I'm going to try this stuff and, and see how it goes. So what would be some of the broad categories of that? You mentioned light. Um, there's obviously, you know, topical sorts of things. Well, how would you paint the broad categories? Like, I want to go look in my room and I want to break it down. Okay, there's light. There's what would the other categories be? Yeah, okay. So, so, you know, big categories are light or circadian rhythm related things. And circadian rhythm related things, you know, include light, activity, temperature, um, eating frequency, uh, uh, social contact. So, you know, it's a sophisticated alarm clock um, with a lot of different inputs. so those are, and then those are all areas you can experiment with in, in your own right. Um, our, you know, our gut microbiome, our skin microbiome, our, our electronics usage and, and, you know, media consumption and news consumption. You know, some people go on these news diets and find that it actually has a really beneficial impact on their mood because um, they're not, you know, reading all of this sensationalistic, you know, news and clickbait headlines and, false outrage, you know, where all, all these news outlets are just trying to get a group of people outraged to, to generate more clicks and advertising stuff. So you can experiment with that. You know, um, Tim Ferriss did an interesting post a few months ago on, on going uh, with a month without alcohol or uh, masturbation. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, you know, f- f- in, in a time when, you know, 90 plus percent of guys are, you know, looking at pornography on a, fa- you know, on a fairly regular basis, um, it, uh, you know, that's a, re- that's a really interesting experiment <laughs> um, on testosterone levels, on your sex life, on your mood, on your motivation, stuff like that. So, um, there, there, you know, and then you can experiment with... Um, you know, different types of working out and, and, and your social group. Um, you know, people say you're, you're the average of, of the five, uh, you know, people you spend the most time with and, uh, and you can run little experiments and, and try that out too. So it's a, um, when, when you move away from some of the raw physical stuff into psychology and human interaction, um, there's pretty much an endless, you know, an endless number of things that you can experiment with. So that's a good starting point, uh, trying different experiments in your room, uh, the people that you spend the most time with, even doing maybe a porn cleanse. I like that idea. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, 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 you know, people just have to figure out what issue they might be struggling with and that might point them in the right direction. mm -hmm. It's the digestive issue, if it's sleep and energy level, you know, depression, stuff like that. Yeah. And as you said, you know, one or two or three or four changes could be, could make dramatic shifts in their lives. You know, I mean, I've talked to plenty of people who remove, they've had issues for years with whether it's, you know, eczema or something, something like that, or lack of focus. Um, and then they cut one thing out of their diet, one thing out of their diet. And they're like feeling amazing. And they're like, holy shit. I right. can't believe I've just been going about my life eating this one thing for you know six years, and I felt like this. So I, right. you know, doing that kind of experimentation, I think, is is a critical mindset to bring if you you know you want to optimize health. Well, and and so you, you get 
changes that are the one thing. But as we talked about, you'll mm-hmm. you'll sometimes combine four or five changes. Uh, my friend Paul Jamine of Perfect Health Diet uh, gave a great example. Um, you know, when you go camping, and uh, suddenly people find that they are falling asleep at nine o'clock. And they're waking up at 6.30, whereas in the city, you know, it might be shifted by three hours or something like that. Well, you know, what changes? What wakes you up in the morning when you're camping? Uh, you know, what, well, what makes you tired? You know, you've been moving all day. Uh, you've been out in the sun. Maybe you've been swimming. Uh, it gets dark. You don't have a lot of light around. Uh, you're on the fire. Maybe you eat earlier while it's still light out. And then you're not eating, you know, late at night. Uh, a lot of people don't bring alcohol with them when they're camping, so you know they're not they're not drinking. Yeah. Um, all these different things, and and then you fall asleep earlier, and and then you wake up in the morning because uh, you know it, it starts to get warmer in the tent. The brightness changes. You start to hear voices. You smell cooking. Uh, um. And you got a good night's night's rest. Uh, yeah, really, you know, our our circadian rhythm is this multifaceted thing, and and so some things require more changes. Yeah, and it's it's kind of so, funny. It's um, like uh, it, sometimes it can be one change. Sometimes it can be one change. Sometimes it can be many. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like camping is sort of this accidental paleo mass experiment. You know, you're making all of these big changes. Right. That's that's funny. Yeah. And so speaking of paleo, you know, I've heard you mention or, or describe paleo as sort of a biohack. So what what do you mean by that? Well, I mean hackers in computer lore and today, um they don't try to understand a system uh necessarily from a theoretical perspective. Um though theory can help you know, they fiddle with it, they tinker with it, they break it, they run little experiments, and through uh, through that process, they figure how it, figure out how it works. And it's a very sort of bottom up, decentralized tinkering, you know, method of arriving at knowledge. And um, and and you don't worry about getting it perfect. Like you know, perfect is the enemy of the good. And you riff, and you you find something that works. Um, and, and so paleo, and, and it tends to be very open source. So paleo is very similar in that it's an, it's an open source, uh, community. Nobody owns the word. Um, people have their own little versions of it that they claim are better for, you know, for different things, uh, which is fine and good. Um, it, uh, people are experimenting. They're using it as a starting point, um, you know, for their, for their own changes. Um, and, you know, it, 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 a lot of amateurs, uh, quite frankly, have uh, have been part of the movement, and and there's a, you know, in in computer lore, like the hackers are usually the smart and scrappy amateurs, um, whereas like the you know the IBM blue shirt guy um, is is more sort of the expert who is slower moving and stuck in old paradigms. Yeah, that's and that's really interesting how the paleo movement. I think that's one of the most fascinating things about the paleo movement is it it hasn't been this you know top down like it came out of the universities or it came from the FDA or it came from some top down sort of um, you know authority on a subject intellectual authority. It was very bottom up, as you said. It was there's kind of independent scholars, you being one of them, that that really composed the paleo movement. Um, so that's interesting. So what, so what do you think about, or what does that say about kind of the, kind of the future of, of, um, you know, how the peer to peer interactions between independent scholars has gave it, given rise to something that typically comes through these kind of institutions? Well, it, um, you know, I, I, I don't think this, movement would be anywhere close to where it is if it weren't for the internet, if it weren't for people sharing examples and stories and tinkering and refining and, and, and having, you know, if, if it's Atkins and one guy owns the brand and the trademark, well, guess what? It's going to rise and fall with the fortunes of that one company. But if there's a whole ecosystem of 
uh, people eating this way and, you know, CrossFit boxes that support it and people writing books and farmers who are into it and like hunting people and MMA fighters and, you know, Novak Djokovic goes gluten free and, all, you know, it's this interesting web and constellation of people that are using it for, you know, in their own ways for their local purposes. And that makes it pretty resilient. You know, people will ask me whether I think paleo is going to crash. And what I usually say is, well, you know, first of all, um, nothing grows forever. So there will come a point where, you know, growth is slower or, uh, you know, there may be some like stabilization at some level and that's fine. Um, but you know, there, there are a lot of people who have adopted paleo for weird autoimmune or digestive conditions, the types of conditions you don't talk about at cocktail parties, and very functional reasons. And I guarantee you, if you've given up, you know, if you've had IBS most of your life and had to stay within 50 yards of a bathroom at all times and you give something up and that goes away, you ain't going back. And uh, so... so when you have a divert, you know, but then other people arrive at it because their pet, you know, they started feeding their dog in a quote paleo fashion. So more like a wolf or whatever, respecting its nature and heritage. Um, so people, there are all these different ent entry points into it. And when you have this diversity of motivations and context, it, it makes for a pretty resilient group of, of folks. And so, um, I don't. I, I don't think it's going to crash. I, I, I really think it's a it's a it's a grassroots movement that is going to hang around for a long time. Yeah, and it's. I mean, in some ways, you you can almost think about it as one of the first kind of uh, like intellectual movements that that came from you know some of the technologies that support that peer to peer kind of sharing. In a lot of ways, it connected independent scholars, um, you know, in a non centralized way to. to create something that's really turned into a movement and improved a lot of people's lives. Yeah. And you know, there, there are a lot of communities that have gotten their start from the internet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, paleo is not necessarily unique in that fashion, but, um, it, it absolutely helped, uh, catalyze it. Yeah. And so we're kind of pulling back a little bit into greater global sort of, uh, implications around this idea of habitat and um, you know biomimicry, and so I, I just had an interesting question that popped up while you were talking about, you know, you think of habitat in terms of like light and source of water that you drink, and and these these things that we encounter in our everyday lives. What are your thoughts on like the habitat of laws and governance and those broader things? Just just curious, like how how you perceive. Uh, the, the 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 effects of environmental things like laws, governance, social structures on the human body. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it, there are huge numbers of effects, both positive and negative, in, in all sorts of different areas. So you could have something like a cor you know corn subsidies or agricultural subsidies that subsidize crops uh, that then get you know, used in all sorts of industrial foods. Um, there are, there are well-intended but misinformed eating guidelines, you know, like to eat all that stuff. Um, there are, you know, different laws and legislation on raw milk and where and how raw milk can be bought, sold, consumed, if at all. Um, and, you know, so th there's, an enormous impact. And then there's, there's culture, you know, if, um, if in French culture, you know, the cuisine and cooking it yourself and people eating slowly is more of a thing and everybody does it and that's what you defend and that's what makes the French French, well, then, you know, traditional, you know, people will defend that way of living. Um, if what is traditional in America is, fast, fast food, uh, Coca-Cola, hot dogs, then traditional people will defend, defend that. And, and so a, a, a country's culture is profoundly important in how healthy we are. And, and quite frankly, Michael Pollan wrote about this in Cooked. Um, you know, we, 
as as women increasingly moved into the workforce, we outsourced a lot of our meals to corporations, and that was a that was disastrous, um, in my opinion. Uh, now, not just because it's corporate or industrial doesn't mean it's bad. But what happened was is that companies started to use ingredients and methods that humans are poorly adapted to. You know, made concoctions that are highly addictive highly uh likely to you know put put you know make you fat and uh and the result is you know more people are are getting fat and sick yeah and i mean to me to round this all up it's like we live in this really dynamically changing habitat that is far more diverse in a lot of ways than than what we evolved with so all these different conditions new things that we invent new types of foods um uh so and new inventions and, and not to mention legal structures and all of that. So with all of that in mind, you know, with with our, our goal geared towards maximizing human flourishing, what do you see as sort of the biggest impediment to optimal human health? And that can be on an individual level or from your perspective on on a more global level. I mean, I mean, globally, um, if you just look at raw numbers of people, uh, you know, food, some basics of food and water in many parts of the globe are, you know, are still sort of the low hanging fruit um, in terms of making sure people just have basic needs met. In in the rest of the world, in the, in the developed and much of the developing world now, um, it, you know, it's, God, it's, it's junk food and it's wheat, corn and soy and it's sugar all the time. What is, so what's the one thing um you know, we don't, it, it might be cost. It might be that in some parts of the world, people are too poor to afford healthier food or a healthier way of living or what they need to survive. And in the rest of the world, we're so rich that we don't actually have to do what is, you know, live in a way that's actually healthy. So we, I, I actually, it's, we've got some economic issues mm -hmm. I think to figure out here interesting yeah and so what what would be you know I mean if we were to we, we had some interesting talks at the festival last year from Zachary Caceres talking about how legal structures you know speaking of habitat and 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 how it can uh, relate to uh, human thriving talking about legal structures and how how they can empower or keep people in 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 poverty um, so that's an interesting, you know, insight I mean, what, regarding habitat. I mean, what, what I still think is probably the greatest risk um, to sort of human health and flourishing right now, I think, is probably antibiotic resistance, antibiotic resistance uh, bacteria. And, um, and, and that's the type of thing where um, if, if antibiotics start to lose their effectiveness, you know, on, on a widespread scale before we have alternatives in place. Um, there's a hell of a lot of modern medicine that isn't going to work, surgeries that aren't going to work, um, and, and there's going to be a lot of uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hmm. I'd love to get some, uh, some resources that we can put in the uh, links here about how people could learn more about that. Yeah, well. for sure. Yeah. And so, okay. So looking, you know, um, to the future a little bit here, do you foresee any big revelations or technologies or insights that you're excited about that are coming in the next five to 10 years with relation to, you know, optimizing health? Um, the, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about the microbiome, uh, the gut and the skin, um, you know, there are companies now, some people have heard about fecal transplants and, you know, where you, you, <laughs> I've you actually been poop. asked, I've been asked for my poop before. Oh man. <laughs> I was, was like, cute? what? <laughs> what? Was she cute? <laughs> yeah, she is cute. <laughs> a good, so, a good friend funny. of mine that, that watches my diet and everything is like, you probably have healthy poop. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> This is the same person who taught me about coffee enemas too. I was like, "What is going on oh, with God. you? I've never heard of this stuff before." <laughs> well, there's uh, basically 
there are companies now that are coming up with some pills that contain spores so that rather than having to do a fecal transplant, you could just swallow this pill and the spores would seed the appropriate sort of bacterial colonies mm -hmm. to, to get rid of, you know, some of these infections and, and other digestive issues. Um, I think that is tremendously exciting. I think the skin microbiome is tremendously exciting. We are just scratching the surface of, uh, of what we're learning there. Um, but at, at the same time, I don't think there is going to be one big breakthrough over the next five, ten years that is going to sort of magically unlock, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be a cure for cancer. I don't think there's going to be um, any one thing where suddenly, you know, 50 million people don't have to die anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so. But so the microbiome and the skin biome, can you just briefly kind of go over a little bit about, you know, for people who don't never heard the word microbiome before, you know, what's, what, what are the implications of, of, of the microbiome and how we're coming to understand it? Yeah, so we have all sorts of bacteria living inside our body and outside of the body. We actually have more... Um, bacterial DNA in our body than our own DNA, uh, more bacterial cells than, than our own body cells. So um, it's, uh, it's everywhere. And we've co-evolved with these microorganisms in a way that um, it's a win-win, uh, mutually beneficial relationship. And, you know, a lot of microorganisms in our gut actually break down and digest food. They play a role in our immune system, uh, all sorts of th all sorts of sort of local and systemic effects of the bacteria that we live with, and um, we have we, we got so concerned with uh, certain infections, and, and rightly so because they were killing lots of people. Um, but we've now the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction, and rather you know we're using too many antibiotics, too much sterile stuff. We're killing our gut bacteria. We're using all these soaps and skincare products that are killing good bacteria on our skin. And uh, we are going to start moving away from that and finding ways to replenish our, these ecosystems of good bacteria. And it's not just going to be one or two of them. It, you know, it's, again, it's going to be this complex interaction, a stable ecosystem where if you have you know, we're going we're gonna to find, they've already found this, but we're going to see it more and more, where if you have not just the presence of one type of bacteria, but the right um, ecosystem of bacteria in your gut or on your skin, you'll be more resistant to infections, you know, you'll be healthier, um, it, it will be less, it will be harder to sort of dislodge that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and and so there, there are going to be a lot of really cool findings mm. in that area. How do you see that playing out? Into, I mean, you mentioned like a pill that can help sprout, help kind of recultivate your, your gut yeah. biome. What, what are sort of the things that, that may be coming out along those lines of how you can recultivate and bring back to life uh, that ecosystem? Yeah, so, so there are companies like Ubiome that are you know taking swabs um, of of your of different parts of your biome and then they're sequencing uh, what they find there and so they're collecting a huge amount of data that is uh, eventually you know obviously they're going to use to try to say okay what's a healthy biome look like what's an unhealthy one look like and how do we get it from unhealthy to healthy mm -hmm. and I'm sure they'll eventually release some treatments um, or products in 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 that capacity. Um, the there's going to be a you know what I'm working on with AO Biome is all right um, we're not going to be able to convince everyone to stop using all skincare products that's it's just unrealistic um, there may be a small percentage of the population that are willing to do that completely um, but too it's just too much of a habit and a ritual for too many people so we've been working on developing biome-friendly soaps and biofriendly shampoos that, you know, where we take combinations of different ingredients and just keep on testing them on good bacteria and seeing which ones good bacteria um, can survive while still making you feel sort of clean and fresh and, and stuff like that. So, you know, there's work in that area. Um, there, there's going to be 
um, efforts to probably rethink the bacterial ecosystem in our homes or in hospitals. Um, I think it was some folks at MIT that were looking at different surfaces that they could put at, in hospitals um, to actually coat them with a substrate for good bacteria. So the, the, rather than trying to keep them sterile, which they're not able to do, they've realized sterility <laughs> is an unachievable goal. And, and so it might be better to create... Uh, you know, calculated unster you know unsterility, um, and and by establishing sort of a, a a a good bacteria on the on the cover of you know handle door handles and uh, sinks and utensils, it, it may halt the spread of bad bacteria more effectively. So there's going to be really cool stuff in you know coming out in that regard. Um, so it's, it, you know, there's going to be a big jump from going, you know, from going f from like, okay, Activia, your yogurt has this one strain of, you know, good bacteria in it. And, and okay, so maybe that one strain gets reinduced to your gut, you know, but maybe it then because of the rest of your diet and how you live, it sort of immediately dies out. The challenge will be, how do you create this new ecosystem? Um, so, so eventually we're going to be doing more than just say eating the Greek yogurt or, you know, taking one specific, uh, probiotic and, and we're going to be taking like a whole complex of, of these different things. And maybe eventually in a certain sequence, like you have to do a, before you can put, introduce B, C and D because B, C and D require E and E is a product of A and 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 so there's there's going to be all sorts of research that goes into how do you establish an e like the right sort of ecosystem in your gut or on your skin and then maintain it. So that's uh, going to be an exciting yeah, area. Yeah, that's fascinating. And you mentioned you know this will improve resistance uh, to illness, and I would imagine all sorts of other benefits as well. Resistance to disease. I mean, what what are some of those the implications of that that you're excited about? Well, um, take the gut. You know, there was just a piece in the Atlantic um, on how they're realizing that a lot of rheumatoid arthritis seems to originate in the gut. Now, folks in, in the paleo space have been saying this for years and, and sometimes to ridicule. And, uh, and what we're realizing is that a lot of weird autoimmune conditions um, originate in the gut because the gut is part of our immune system. It is a major interface with the outside world and any of our major interfaces with the outside world have to have an, an important immune layer to them that's functioning properly. Same with our skin. So um, I, I think they're going to be Wait, was your question around what were the specific applications just, of some of them? No, just um, you know the, the importance of, of the gut biome microbiome in terms of, of the benefits oh, that effect, having a healthy right. ecosystem yeah. would, would provide. Yeah, so, so there are going to be a whole host of like direct digestive issues and autoimmune conditions in different parts of the body that that's going to help. Um, it's going to absolutely help um, with, uh, you know, avoiding, trying to reduce, like we're, we're going to start being smarter about infants and kids and making sure that they aren't immediately cleaned when they're born, that they retain some of the, you know, the mother's mucus and blood and things like that, which, which are actually good for the baby. Um, and hopefully one day we should see a decline in some of all these allergies and asthma. And I mean, kids can't even, you know, have nuts, you know, at, at, at lunch anymore in the schools because there's so many kids that have peanut allergies or other nut allergies that, that they've just banned them entirely. And, and or they'll have a table, not for the kids with the allergies, but they'll have a table for the kids who bring in the nuts, and they'll have to go sit with each other. So hopefully we should see a decline in allergies, um, asthma, other autoimmune conditions. Um, um, and, and, and then on the skin, um, there's a whole set of weird autoimmune conditions that manifest on the skin, uh, whether you're talking about eczema or uh, psoriasis rosacea, things like that, some of times which are just not very well understood, but clearly inflammation is, is playing a role. Um, I think it's, so, so because microorganisms are a major part of our immune system, autoimmune conditions 
right, dysregulations in our immune system in that regard are going to be a, a very big area for, you know, for the gut and the skin. Um, and, but then we're going to find probably that, um, you know, we're, we've have interesting data at AOBiome on uh, wounds healing faster when, when this is sprayed on them. They've done some work on mice um, and, uh, you, you know, or uh, it, the byproduct of some of this stuff is, is nitric oxide and nitric oxide is this really important molecule in the body. That's a vasodilator. It relaxes blood vessels. It's the same. The nitric oxide channel is how like Viagra works yeah. um, and, and hypertension drugs and blood pressure drugs. Um, so there are, you know, there are types of bacteria where yes, there may be a local effect on the skin, but it's like, holy cow, this may have been one of our body's major sources of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is used in all these different channels, heart disease, you know, erectile dysfunction, blood pressure, whatever. So there's possibilities that um, by, you know, regulating our microbiome, but microbiome better, it could, it could affect all sorts of different stuff. Oh, that's fascinating and exciting about the future, too. And yeah. Yeah, well, and what I like about the microbiome stuff is that, you know, we don't have to invent some new technology, right? We, in, in part, we need to identify what these ecosystems are and then figure out ways to seed them and maintain them, which is very different than saying, we're going to come up with some technology or method to cure cancer yeah. once and for all. And yeah, so so with all of that in mind, I mean, I hear the theme running through this of of you know sort of understanding through experimentation. We live in this dynamic environment that we didn't necessarily evolve in, and um, so with that in mind, but, so, yeah, hey, yeah, you you were just going in and out on that. Can you? Ah, yeah, that? sorry. So I, I was just sort of recapping. I want to ask you one more question, but. With, all, with this theme that runs through what we're talking about with the optimal health of, of sort of understanding your personal habitat and how it can affect your health and that experimentation is sort of um, one of the core mindsets that you can have to improve your own personal health, uh, what do you envision you know, for a positive potential future for humanity if we were to to, you know, what is, is it that we would, we would be experimenting to the degree that we embrace it and we come to really understand the human body and our environment more deeply? Or what's your kind of picture for a positive potential future? I, I, I mean, I would love, I would, I would love to see a future where sort of our architecture, the actual <laughs> structure of our buildings is very different. You know, if, if you, if for comparison, if you go to some old zoos from the early 20th century or before, it's concrete and bars and um, it's very industrial. And, and frankly, a, a lot of these building materials are very common in cities. And what they've shifted to is, um, you know, different enclosures that have skylights or um, built in ways to move or be active. And so I envision a time when, when, when we start to have some buildings and structures that are, are, are for example, the, um, you know, kitchens, you're more likely to say compost if you actually have a dedicated spot in your kitchen. Um, or you're more likely to use the kitchen if it's a social space that's sort of open onto another space so that you don't feel alone when you're in there. Um, it would be interesting to have floors with different surfaces or like rooms in a home that don't have furniture that you can sit on in, in a way that would hurt your posture. But maybe there's other ways to like rest or relax. Um, moving away from like steel and concrete and more wood and other sort of slightly irregular surfaces. Um, homes, right, built where you can control the micro, microbial ecosystem, where you have technologies like Nest that allow you to dynamically change the temperature throughout the day um, so that you can get sort of hotter temperatures during the day, cooler temperatures at night. Um, Eventually, systems like Philips Hue spread throughout the whole house where you can control the lighting and, and have, you know, brighter blue light in the morning and, and like dimmer light at night. 
So there are all these different ways that I think we're going to eventually be able to, to change our physical spaces, and I'm extremely excited about that. That is very exciting. And are you familiar with any anyone who's kind of doing that, who's got this, that, like, doing that sort of architecture? I mean, one I, I'm familiar a little bit with Michael Rice, who's a like, does bioarchitecture, um, which is I think it takes into account more more of like the magnetics of of of, um, of uh, architecture with the human body. But um, are you familiar with any anybody who's doing who's kind of who we could check out that's that's doing some of that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, I mean different pieces. So you know, Nest is very well known. They're the uh, um, thermostat company yep. that Google bought. Philips Hue is doing is doing some of the lighting. Um, there there are. Uh, there's like a high-end home company either in New York or Vegas where um, – what is it? I, I think like the shower has like supposedly has good bacteria in it or something like that. Um, there are you know different light boxes and devices um, you know, for people to start, start uh, changing you know, the, the light that they receive. But I mean nobody's – no, I haven't really seen something that's designed from scratch mm -hmm. for optimal health. It, it still tends to be sort of boxy rooms using conventional materials, and then we'll outfit those with, with a few of these technology gadgets. So um, I haven't seen it yet, really. Yeah, there's room for experimentation there and, and the entrepreneurs to get involved. That's awesome. Yep. That's really exciting. Well, I've, I've held you for longer than I promised, and I appreciate every, every word. It's been a lot of fun, John. Yeah, it has been fun. Thank you, Seth. It was, it was fun to riff. Oh, yeah. All right. Take care, man. Cool. See you, man. See ya.